Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this sermon. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. It's also our hope that this sermon would not be used to replace God's plan for authentic relationships in your life through a local church. If you aren't already a member of a local church, we just want to encourage you to step out in faith and join a church somewhere near you. Thanks again for checking out this sermon. We pray it is a blessing to you. Uh, let me pray, and then we're going to jump into what we're here to talk about today. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, we are grateful that we get to sing your praises, um, that even right now that, that you're hearing my voice and our hearts as we lift up prayers to you, Lord God. That your presence is here. You promise it. And when we gather in your name, you are here. And so, God, you are not distant, but you are here. God, with us corporately, and, and you know every single individual here intimately, Lord God, and you love us. And, Lord, as we open up your word, I pray that you would just breathe life into all of us, into every area of our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's Easter. It's Resurrection Day. This is, yeah, you can cheer. That's awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> it is of the utmost importance, the resurrection. Everything in Christianity hinges on, on the truth of the resurrection. That's why we've come here to celebrate. Or like I said, maybe you were walking by and you thought it was a party. No, it is. It is. It's a party because our, our Savior, Lord, and King is not in a tomb, but He's on the throne. And, and so today is Resurrection Day. It's the utmost, most uh, ultimate importance. And here's why. Without it, the Bible tells us our faith is pointless. Without it, our faith is pointless. There is no Christianity. We put our faith in something that isn't there. 1 Corinthians, it says this in chapter 15. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. It's incapable of producing any useful result. It's pointless, powerless, and unproductive. You are still in your sins. If the resurrection has to happen, if it hasn't happened, then our faith, what we put our faith in, in Christ Jesus, is pointless. There is no salvation. Salvation is non-existent if that's the case. We are still in our sins. In Romans chapter 10, it lays out kind of what it takes to be saved, to be made in the right relationship with God, that our sins against God would be forgiven and that we would be righteous and with him. And it lays out kind of what, it, what that takes. It says this, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, not Jesus was Lord, is. He has to be alive. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It had to happen. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Our faith is pointless if it hasn't happened. Salvation is non-existent if it hasn't happened. The preaching that I'm doing right now is useless, the Bible says. In that same book, the letter to the church in Corinth, it says, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. But, he is risen. That's why we're here. That's why we're here nearly 2,000 years later and then we come together in large form and mass to, to celebrate our risen king. He is risen. Risen. It goes on in that same chapter of, of the book in, uh, of 1 Corinthians. I don't know why I'm stuttering so much. Sorry, I apologize. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man and the resurrection of the dead came also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So what does that mean? That means our faith does matter. That means salvation does exist. And that means that this preaching is useful. Praise God, I do it all the time. 
that, it, that it's powerful, that it's useful, that our faith is powerful and effective and pointed and, and it does something, it produces something because he is risen. There's three things I want you to get today and, and pretty simple, you're gonna remember them. One, he is risen. The second, life is given. And the third, brand new mission. Simple, right? You know why I keep it simple? Because I'm simple. I know you're smarter than me. You probably made it more eloquent, but this is what it is. He is risen. Life is given. Brand new mission. And we're going to unpack that with the rest of our time here today. He is risen. It was planned and predicted. God had said it and established that this is the way that he was going to redeem fallen, broken people that are not perfect to himself, the holy, righteous, and perfect one. That there is no way in our own strength, in our own effort, in our own works of us ever being good enough to have right standing or be able to stand in the presence of the Most High God. He's too holy. His glory is too powerful. And anytime we think that in my own actions without God I can become godly, um, we think too highly of ourselves and too lowly of God. We have made it just a little hop, skip, and a jump, and a little bit of effort, and we're good. That's not the case. The gap is too large. It's a bridge too far. It's one that only God can bridge and he has in Christ Jesus. Not that we would attain to him, but that he humbled himself to come to us and live amongst us that we could be right with him. It was spoken of 700 years in advance before Jesus is on the scene by a prophet named Isaiah. I'm going to read some of it because he talked about what would happen on the cross and the fact that Jesus would be raised from the dead. Listen to this. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we consider him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. What are they saying? Like you, you, you see that Christ was brutalized even to death on a cross, and it's easy to see that, that God was punishing, and so you think, okay, he's being punished because it's something he did, but it explains here that the punishment that he took was not his own, but it is a punishment for the sins that we've done. That in Christ, he's, he's taken our sins and the punishment due those sins. It's something called penal substitution. The penalty had a substitute. That there is a penalty due our sins and there is a substitute that stepped in the place that is Jesus Christ. Listen to this. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. That's why on Friday they call it Good Friday. It is brutal. It is brutal. The God-man Jesus Christ comes lives a perfect sinless life, deserves nothing of what he receives, but he receives it on our behalf, that we would receive nothing that we deserve, that we would receive grace, right relationship, forgiveness. It's good, but it's good for us as it was horrific on him, but he took it anyways out of the love that he has for us, not because we're so great he had to, but because he's so great he wanted to. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. He gets wounds, we get healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. My goodness. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. If you, if you read what happens on that, that day of Jesus' crucifixion, you see that all of this plays out to the T. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? Nobody. They're asking the, the crowds what they should do with Jesus, and there's, there's not a big uproar like, well, let him go, we all love him. No. The Bible says that everyone there yelled together, crucify him, crucify him. There's not a protest or an uproar. For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. He died amongst thieves. And with the rich in his death, he was buried in the tomb of a rich man. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, and his actions and his words, he's perfect and sinless. Yet it was the Lord's will, it's God's plan to crush him and cause him to suffer. That might sound crazy. It might seem like, oh, poor Jesus, he didn't have a choice. It was just 
the Lord's plan to do that to him. He's the God-man Jesus Christ. He humbly volunteered himself to receive the punishment, do our sins. That he would raise again and defeat sin and death that we might take his righteousness as he takes our sin. That God loves us so much that he wanted a, a tight-knit relationship with us to bring us from far to near. And so he did that through Christ Jesus. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. What's that saying? Listen, you know what happens to offerings, right? They kill them. All through the Old Testament. That's what happens to animals over and 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 over. They're sacrificed. And they die and their lifeblood is spilled. And so Jesus' lifeblood is spilled on our behalf. He dies in our place, but his days are prolonged 700 years in advance. It speaks of a coming Savior that would take our sins and that would still live. Okay. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. It's, it's planned, it's predicted. This has been God's plan since the beginning. Since man sinned against God, he had a plan to redeem them to himself. And Jesus said it would happen this way. Three times in a row he predicts it in, in Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 10. We're going to look at chapter 10. But Jesus tells his disciples exactly how it's about to go down. He's calling his shot. Mark 10, 32 and 34, it says, They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and to the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Jesus is speaking of himself of the resurrection, that on the third day, he will be back. It had to happen. It was planned and predicted that it would happen. For God to be faithful and true to his own word, it had to happen. For us to, to have faith that matters, for this preaching to be useful, for salvation to be effective, it had to happen. Everything hinges on it. Everything. And it happened. It happened. Just as Jesus said it would. And, you know, we leave, live in an awesome time um, where nowadays, even amongst scholars, it is argued that this really happened, even by secular scholars, that Jesus' resurrection really happened. Like, they will give you, even those that do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ, will sit across and say, well, based on historical evidence, we know that. His disciples and, those, and his followers at least believed that they saw him and spent time with him after he died. So they won't say, oh yeah, it happened for sure because they're still a skeptic of who Jesus is. But they'll give you like, well, we at least know for sure based on the transformation and the change that happened in those people and in that community that got pushed forward. We know that they at least, they believed it. It happened just as Jesus said that it would. On the first day of the week, that's the third day, that's the day that we're celebrating. Very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Clothes that gleamed like lightning. Um, I don't know, if, if you know me outside of just seeing me on Sunday, you know that pretty much every day I just wear a white t-shirt. Um, I mean, I'm fully clothed, but I wear a white t-shirt. <clears throat> you don't know me that well. I just, that, that's, uh, I don't like to have to make a decision every day about what I'm going to wear, so I just buy um, packs of white t-shirts. And whenever they get too many stains or they're done um, doing what they're called to do, I go to Costco, get another pack. 
you know that even sometimes I just break them out of the pack and throw them on. Like they don't, they don't go through the washer dryer first. They just, they go on and you can still tell because there's like a crease right here and some creases, a couple here. Because they fold them real nice when they put them in there. And you know, even when it's fresh out like that and it is, it's like, whew, dang, that's, um, nobody's ever accused me of looking like I'm walking in wearing lightning. Like this is more than just some dudes and some white tees. That, that right here in the tomb, Jesus isn't to be found. The stone is rolled away and they're wondering what's going on. And two men show up um, with clothes that are magnificent. They're angels. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, which is a pretty regular response in Scripture when an angel shows up. But the men said to them, listen to this. Why do you look for the living among the dead? <laughs> Are you looking for Jesus? Wrong spot. He is not here. He has risen. And there's an exclamation point there. I don't want to yell at you. I probably will yell at you. He has risen. Why are you here amongst the tombs? Aren't you looking for Jesus? Now listen to this. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. You know, it's easy to look at people in Scripture often and like judge them based off of their responses, what they did or didn't do. Because it seems so obvious to us 2,000 years later when we've already read through it and we know what's happening next. But we've all been in this place before or, you, or you've told somebody before something very specific and you thought they heard you and then it happened just like you said and they looked at you like, I can't believe that happened. If you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. Or friends. Right? You're like, hey, don't put your open glass on the side of the table. Don't do that. It's not good. It'll spill. 75 times later, after you've said it, it falls. And your kid looks at you or your friend looks at you like, I can't believe that happened. And you're like, didn't I tell you? Didn't I? And here we see that, that the women are wondering what's happened. And the angel says, like, didn't, like, he told you this is going to happen. So now they remember like, oh, yeah, this is how it's supposed to play out. When they came back from the tomb, they told all the things to the 11 and to all the others. I love this. I, I love this. I love that the first ones to declare that there's an empty tomb and that he is risen. The Bible says that even the, the women were the first ones to see Jesus alive. Um, I love that it's the women. I, I love it because in that culture specifically, um, women were kind of looked down on. Their voice didn't carry as much weight. And God is so awesome. He likes to just mess things up. That the ones that would come back and get to experience and then be the first ones to declare that the tomb is empty to his followers are the women that went there. It's a great statement. I could teach on it all day about how we are equal in Christ Jesus. And so the women come back and they, they tell Jesus' closest companions, the 11, the disciples. And then it goes and tells of who the women are. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told us the apostles, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Um, we know, it, uh, because this is reading from Luke's account uh, in the book of John, John writes the gospel of John, of how this all went down, um, and we know that John lets us know that, that Peter's not the only one that ran to the tomb, John did also. And the reason that's funny is uh, John wrote his gospel um, after all the other apostles have died. And what he says about running to the tomb that isn't recorded in the other gospels is that the disciple that Jesus loved outran Peter to the tomb. I love this. God, it, like this is God's word. He is inspired by his Holy Spirit, everything that is in here, but he still... Uh, allowed the personalities of the people he worked through to come through. So you see John who's like, oh yeah, I'm the one Jesus loves and I'm faster than Peter. I love it. And it says that he, <laughs> that he beat him there, but that he waited because, you know, Peter, Peter's kind of, uh, uh, he, he's 
the one that gets to go in first. And so he gets, John beats him there and then waits so that Peter can go in and see that Jesus isn't there. I love that. I love that. I love that God works through people that are pretty ordinary people. That he just thought it was important that 2,000 years later we knew that John could beat Peter in a foot race. <laughs> like Peter might get all the accolades later, but hey. I love it. I love it. So Peter and John, they, they run to the tomb. Peter is this bending over. He saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away wondering to himself what has happened. So he experiences uh, what has happened there. He sees that Jesus is not there. I got to tell you something. Um, it's more than just an empty tomb though. It's empty because the man that was laying in there is now alive. And he is seen by many, many people. In fact, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, it, it says this. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Like he had to prove to them, the ones that he's standing in front of, like, no, I'm alive. Like, for some of them, he had to say, come touch me. Look, I'm right here. He broke bread with them. He ate, he ate meals with them. He taught them. And, and the Bible lets us know, it says he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So for 40 days, he's seen by people in the community after it is proven and seen that he is executed and killed, that he is wrapped up in, in 75 to 100 pounds of linen cloth, stuck into a tomb. The tomb is empty, the linen cloth is still there, and he is alive. And, and people are seen all over the place because for 40 days, he continues to tell people and teach people about the kingdom of God. Hmm. First Corinthians 15, Paul says it like this. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Hmm. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. This is the most important thing. That Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. I'm going to continue on with what this says, but, but I love this. He says, he took our sins according to Scripture. He was buried. He was raised according to Scripture. That he appeared to Peter, the 12, then to over 500 believers at the same time. And, and, and I love because he says, most of which are still alive. The few have fallen asleep. The statement he's making right there is, if you don't believe me, get on your donkey. Go to Jerusalem. And you just make a line of witnesses out the door. It's going to go around the block. Of over 500 people. That's one time. He was there for 40 days. One time over 500 people experienced and saw Jesus Christ, the risen king. And I, like in a courtroom, it only takes a couple people to be eyewitnesses to get you locked up. That he's saying, like, listen, not only the prominent people in the church, but also 500 other believers that will, will get in line and they will speak to the fact that this has actually happened. And he goes on. Then he appeared to James. James is Jesus' younger half-brother. Different dads. James along with the other brothers earlier in Scripture, mocks Jesus. Like, oh, you're so special. Why don't you go now and do your special stuff? James does that. James, after seeing Jesus Christ risen, has a transformation. James ends up being the pastor of that local congregation there. Not only that, but he ends up being martyred for his faith, that they tell him to renounce that Jesus Christ is who he says he is or die, and he says, I can't. That he must stand on the fact that, that, that his, 
older half-brother is the savior of the world. Siblings don't do that. Like you have to see them alive after they've been dead, after they told you they're going to raise again, for you to really believe that. That you don't just make that swing where you used to mock him and now you die for that. Let me just tell you something, like Peter also died for that. Peter denied Christ three times in one night, but Peter would go on later to, to stand amongst the believers and preach a message where, or not amongst the believers, just amongst people, and that message, 3,000 people would put their faith in Jesus, repent of their sins, and be baptized and added to the people that day. The church went from 120 people to 3,120 in a day. It's a lot of baptisms. So, so Peter has this transformed life. He's also martyred for his faith. Many other Christians are. And here's the deal. You don't die for something that's a lie. Like when we lie, when people lie, you do it for your own benefit and good. You don't do it so that it might get you killed. Okay, we don't lie, but people, there's people out there. <laughs> the reason that we do it is because we think that it'll get us into a favorable position. You'll see me a certain way. You'll give me certain things. There'll be a favorable response to this. That's why I'm going to tell an untruth because I think it will benefit me. You don't, while looking your killers in the eyes, make up a lie so that they'll decide to kill you. Not in mass like this. Not with these transformed lives that, that impact not only the local region but the world we know. That today in Lacey, Washington, there's this many of us and not just this church and many churches that are celebrating the risen king. He goes on and says, Last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Paul, formerly known as Saul of Tarsus, he says, listen, not only to show up to all of them, but the guy that's writing this to you right now, I used to be the one that tried to kill believers and stop the, the, the spreading of the gospel. I'm that guy. I'm the one that was the forefront, the leader of uh, getting rid of them, that I would have them thrown in prison, some of them killed. But then what happened is I came in contact with the risen King Jesus Christ and it messed me up. That the, that the majority of the New Testament is written by a guy that tried to wipe out the people that would need it written. But that God transforms him to the place that now he's the champion pushing forward the gospel. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's all of us. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen, I said three things. He is risen. Say he is risen. Okay, we got through that one. But listen, the other ones are really fast. How many of us the main point? The resurrection is he is risen. That for 40 days, he, he walks and, and teaches and is amongst, and then he ascends into heaven and sits on the throne, and he's coming back. The first point was he is risen. The second one is life is given. It's freely given. Life is given. Now and Later. A life worth living now with him. And an eternal life with him in a resurrection body. A resurrected body that, that is so much better than the ones we have now. That when Christ comes back, we get a new body. Listen, maybe or maybe not, did you see me? Before I get up here, almost every week, I'm in the front row and I do some of these. I'm stretching. You know why? Because my hip hurts. I'm so ready to have a resurrection body. <laughs> Not affected by age and sin. And that we, we get a, a perfect body unaffected by those things. That we get to live eternally with him. Oh, man. That we have life given to us. Given. Not that we worked for it so that we could boast, but as given in the works of Christ Jesus that we would receive it by faith and walk it out. 
Romans 6, 3 through 11 says this. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Baptism for us. Maybe you've seen baptism. Maybe you've been baptized where we uh, submerge someone into the water and they come out. It's a sign. It's an outward expression of what God has done. That the old us is dead and gone, has died with Christ. And that the new us, a new creation is here. And that we have a hope of a future resurrection with him forever. It says, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism in death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Okay. For if we have been united with him in death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in resurrection like his for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. That we were slaves to sin, but that sin no longer has mastery over us because we have died to sin. Our sin has died and we have died with Christ that now we live a new life with a new Lord. You know, oftentimes what happens is we put our faith in, in, in Jesus, the saving works and what he's done and, and we're made new, but we tend to still cling to the old dead us. That nasty, stank dead us. I'm not talking about your neighbor next to you, I'm talking about you. We tend, to, we tend to do that. It's our familiarity. What would I do if I wasn't with the old dead me? Like, that's what I know. That's what I am. No, that, that, that old you is dead. To die with Christ. You're a new creation. That doesn't mean that you will be perfect. It doesn't mean that every once in a while there won't be some stench of the old dead you in the air. But that you are holy and righteous because of the works of Jesus Christ and you are being perfected to, and transformed into his image to be like him. And that we would understand that because oftentimes... Um, as Jesus is reminding us of that, that we are new in him, for some reason we like to go back and, and be at that dead place. But that at the cross, the old us is dead. He has given us life, life worthy of living, a, a life of, of being satisfied in who he is and who he has called us to be. Hmm. The death he died, he died once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Listen, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. I love that. Count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That when sin would come, you would just, when your temptation comes, you can just remind it, I'm dead to you. You're dead to me. You're, you're looking for the wrong person. You're looking for the dead me. Go to the cross. Have that out with Jesus. This is the new me. And even if I don't always feel like it, it is truth because God is faithful. Okay. Say, he is risen. Say, life is given. And then lastly, we have a new mission, a brand new mission. If we keep reading in Romans chapter 6, it says this. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourselves to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. That he is risen. Because of that, that means his death had the ability to do what he said it was going to do to take the, the punishment of our sins, take our sins, take the shame, the guilt of our sins, to take the old dead us and, and make us alive with him and on mission with him. Okay, I don't know if you heard that. On mission. That is no longer about, sometimes what happens is we're like, I want to do what I want to do, but I want God to bless it. So we're like, God, 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 just get on my mission. There's a better mission. There's a better mission. And God allows us to come onto his mission, what he's doing. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to go home today and change your job or your, your friend groups necessarily. Maybe it does. But, but make sure that he's, that's clear first from him. 
But, but what I'm saying is that it's a, it's a new me. Even I can go into the same place with a new mission. I can go to the same old job and the dead me used to come in one way, but the new alive me comes in totally different. I used to come in as an instrument for wickedness that I was an instrument not used for singing his glory, but for singing the glory of me and the things around me and the ways of this world. But now when I get played, I'm played to the glory of God. That the song that comes through my life brings him glory. It brings me benefit and me joy. And others are edified, encouraged, uplifted as they see light in, in the space of darkness. That I have been put on mission and God is so good and so loving that, that he takes people like us that are imperfect. That's us. And, and calls us to be a part of his perfect plan. It, it's amazing. He could have just bypassed us. And, and if I just kind of sit back and, and get big headed, I could think that it would have been a better idea. Like God, couldn't you just every once in a while write it in the clouds? He could. He could. But he did it. He did it all through Christ Jesus on the cross. And then he allows that we would be the ones on mission with him to push out the message of the cross and of the resurrection. That he would bring us on mission with him, the, the imperfect people on pushing forth the perfect gospel of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and we're so blessed. You know, the word instrument there isn't just an instrument like you see on stage, but it's, it's a tool. It's a tool. If you think of something like a hammer, it can be used for lots of different things. It can be used for destruction. You can, you can take walls out with a hammer. Or you can build them. And that our lives have been redeemed. That we would be producers and that, that he would work in and through us to push forth his kingdom and transform lives. That, that people in our environments would have the their eternity change as he works through us humbly doing what he's called us to do. He is risen. Life is given. We have a new mission. And I'll close with this verse about that new mission. For Christ's love compels us. You hear that? It's not guilt that compels us. It's not, oh, I guess I have to. If we're in that space of feeling like, oh, I'm getting guilted in, in, into that, um, I would say stop whatever you feel the guilt that you have to do. Now, there's a difference between guilt and like a healthy Holy Spirit conviction. Because sometimes it's not guilt, it's the Holy Spirit moving in you. But that's an encouraging thing to follow after who God is. That's compelled by love. I think if, if we're feeling compelled by guilt to walk with God, then we haven't understood his love yet. And before we move forward and doing those things we feel guilted to, stop, don't do them. Come back to the foot of the cross. Remember what he's done for you. It is not effort that we put forth to try to earn some sort of rightness with God. We cannot put forth enough effort to deserve grace. Grace on its own is undeserved favor. We can't do enough work for that. And we, we would be wrong to do so. Instead, it's the opposite. We have already received that favor, received that grace, and the work that we do is grace-driven effort, not an effort to deserve grace. I hope you heard that. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, and we see as we look through the context of Scripture, that's all that put their faith in him, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, listen to this, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Yeah, but Russ, you don't know what I've been through, man. I get it for some people, but, but I'm, I'm like the worst of the worst. I, I'm in my family. I'm, I'm the, the least in my family. I'm the lowest on the totem pole. I, I'm the, the, the biggest scum in the community. I don't know how I got duped here. I was afraid the church might just collapse when I walked in the door. It says to all. All. 
you are made a new creation. And you know what I love about that? In Christianity, there is no place for pride. There is no space to boast. That whether you grew up in church and can recite every memory verse since you were three years old, or, or you walked in here today and, and you feel like um, l- l- super undeserving, um, none of us by our own works are saved. All of us are dependent on the works of Jesus Christ, not by works, so that none of us can boast. None of us can look at each other and be like, oh, well, you got saved, so did I, but I deserved it more. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You didn't. And and for those that say like, oh, yeah, but I don't deserve it. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that the gospel? He still gave it. He wasn't obligated to because you deserved it. He gave it because he's awesome and he's loving. Listen to this. If anyone is in Christ, anyone, anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us. That means bringing back into right relationship. Reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Listen, we're going through this thing called the Kazone experience and in it you'll figure out um, where your gifts are, your talents, and, and why God has um, allowed or done certain things in, in your past. So that you can look at either the successes and, the, and the, you think the significant times, or you can even look in the broken and the horrific times and, and, and see, okay, God was still there with me. God still had a plan to redeem even the brokenness for his glory, for my good, and for the benefit of others. And, and, and we want to help people find that so they can come up with a mission statement for their life of, of who they are and what they do, their purpose in God's kingdom and pushing it forth in the world today. And can I tell you that all of those things that we'll find will just be parts in the body, but all of us are called to the same ministry. It's the ministry of reconciliation. That we would use that, that history, that we would use those gifts and those talents to, to cry out to people that they can be right with God because of the works of Jesus Christ. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. He committed it to us. He decided that through believers, they would push forth this message. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. You know what's weird is is God will tell us something sometimes, and and we'll tell him something back and like refute what he's, he's God. And so he says, I've given you the ministry of reconciliation. And we want to argue back, yeah, but I'm not qualified. But I'm not good enough. But I don't have this skill or this. I don't have, okay, I see that. Okay, I see that Pastor Russ is is called to be an ambassador and speak those words. Because look, they gave him a microphone. That all of us. Once we have been reconciled, are called to go out and tell others about the beauty of how we were reconciled. Not that we worked it off, but that our sins were not counted against us because of Jesus. And that we are good with the Heavenly Father, that we can walk in confidence into His presence of of the holy, righteous, sovereign one because of what He has done. Because He loves us so much that He wasn't okay with the distance that was between us that we made by our sin. that That Jesus came to us to bring us to the Father that we would be reconciled. And that all of us have been commissioned as ambassadors, the highest ranking representatives that God has here on earth to to declare that to the world around us. We implore you. Now it's going to tell us how to be ambassadors. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Here it is. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. Here's how God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's the message. As an ambassador, just like you. I'd be reconciled to God. And realize the only way is through Christ Jesus, that the one who knew no sin would be sin for us, that we would become the righteousness of God. And it only happens when we put our faith in him, our trust in him, ask him to be Lord of our life. 
It's not a, a ritualistic um, prayer that you say and repeat after me. Not that that is bad, but it's much deeper than that. It's saying Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that he's raised from the dead, that he sits on the throne, that he's king of all kings and Lord of all lords, high and above all things, and asking him to be that of your life, that I'm no longer the Lord of my life. You are. I believe it. Uh, It's the only way to be reconciled to God. It's the only way to be made right with him. And today we celebrate the way that that is. That is through Jesus, his perfect sinless life, his substitutional death, His resurrection defeating sin and death. Ascending to heaven, he sits on the throne, he's coming back for those that have put their faith in him. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to pray. And then we're going to get back into a song. Don't run off. I want to give you a chance and I want you to take the opportunity to respond to the goodness of God. That he is risen, life is given, and we're on mission. So as we sing, I'm going to ask you in just a moment, you're going to stand with me. We're going to have prayer partners um, on the sides of the building here. And if you need prayer for anything, they'd love to pray with you. After we sing for a moment, um, my friend Billy, who was up here earlier, is going to come back up here. And he's going to talk to you just very briefly about the specific ways that maybe God is moving in you and drawing you to himself. Maybe what the next step is for you uh, today before you leave here. And so... um, If we could do this, if you could just stand with me for a moment as the worship team comes up. If everybody could stand with me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, I thank you. God, I thank you for the amazing work that you have done. God, I thank you that out of great love for us, you sent your son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, I thank you for your humility that at any moment you could have ended it. At any moment you could have called down the strength of heaven to stop the the, the brutal beating and death on the cross that you took for us, that, that you appeased the wrath that was due our sins, that you received it on yourself extending your love and grace and righteousness to us that we may be made right. And we are grateful here in this place today. Today we celebrate that we have a risen king, not a dead man that we worship. God, I thank you that you have sent your Holy Spirit that the Spirit of the Most High God would live inside of all those that have put their faith in Christ. And God, that you are faithful and your presence is here and that you are active and moving right now in this place. God, I thank you that in Christ Jesus we see that you bring dead things to life and right now I ask that any that are under the sound of my voice that that are dead in their sins, that right now, Lord God, you would be bringing life to them in Jesus. That hard hearts in this place would be being softened. God, I just pray that your your powerful hand will be outstretched in this place over all of us and and us as individuals, Lord, that hearts that are broken would be mended. God, I thank you that you bore our suffering, our sin, took our wounds and extend healing to us. God, right now I ask that. I ask that you would be reconciling broken relationships in a phenomenal and miraculous way. God, I pray for physical bodies here, Lord God, that as we long for and excited for the resurrection body that we will receive, we know that we're in these ones now that waste away. But God, I pray that you would move in a way to to even do a a phenomenal miracle in our physical bodies, that there would be a healing work that's happening in physical bodies right now. God, I pray that in spaces where we're we're, we're stressed out because of a lack of provision, we would remember that we serve the one who owns everything. God, that you would bring miraculous provision to those spaces. God, where we lack wisdom on what to do next, that you would bring wisdom. God, where maybe this this life can be difficult and and hard to understand and, and 
chaotic, God, and I just pray that in that space right now you would be bringing peace that surpasses all understanding. God, that you would be bringing order into our lives. God, for those in this, this place that are fighting to be good, to try to prove something to you or to others, God, I pray that right now they would find rest. God, that you would take the weight off of them, the weight that you took in Christ on the cross. Jesus has received it. It is not in our religious workings that we are set free, but in the work of Jesus Christ. God, help us just to find rest in you. God, those that are lonely in this place, help them to realize that they are not alone, that you have bridged the gap and that you are drawing them to a relationship with you that is closer than any relationship that we can have here. And you have not only reconciled them to you, the head of the church, but also to the body, to the family of believers, to brothers and sisters, that we are not built to walk this alone, but to have authentic relationships where we spur each other on. God, there's many other things that people are wrestling through. And God, I thank you that you so intimately know us, that you know every single thing. And God, that you are so powerful, that you have the ability to transform any and all circumstances. God, the most important thing is our relationship with you. That's where it all comes from. It's all found in Christ Jesus, not apart from. God, that today as we lift up Jesus, all of these things are happening. God, we love you. We are grateful and you are worthy of all honor, all glory, all praise. We will sing it now by the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing.